those of you who know me at all, or if you've been around the shepherd for at least a month, <laughs> or a year, could suspect that when we get to this Sunday, with this collect about reading, learning, marking, and inwardly digesting the scripture, I'm going to get excited about the Bible. <laughs> Last year, I was able to talk about a great training I just had on a fabulous Bible study program I use. And I just got an update last week. <laughs> and a month ago, I spoke about various methods of interpreting the Bible, chiefly literal versus allegorical, with a bit of feminist thinking thrown in. So I wouldn't want, given this opportunity, to disappoint you. <laughs> Indeed, I would hope to accept you. My love of the Bible goes way back. I distinctly remember May 14th, 1971. A friend and I rode our bikes to a major shopping center in Portland, Oregon, about 12 miles. As we were wandering through the mall, we went into a Christian supply store. I espied a fake leather bound King James Version of the Bible, and I bought it. Here it is. <laughs> it's not the date in it, which is how I remember it. <laughs> I couldn't wait to get home and start reading. I don't quite remember why I was so eager, just that I was. After our ride, I settled down with my new acquisition. I opened to, in the beginning, the heavens and the earth, and went <clears> on <throat> from there. It didn't take long, however, before I began stumbling on King James English <laughs> and the lists of obscure, unpronounceable names. I put that Bible down, sure that there was something in it that was worthwhile, but aware that I wasn't going to find it in this version. Several years later, during my first year in college, I bought another Bible. This one, a large, leather-bound, New American Standard Version, with my name printed on it. I was assured by my pastor and friends that this version was the closest to the ancient languages, and therefore more accurate. And it didn't have all the these and thous of King James. <laughs> And not only did I read it, not beginning in the beginning, but I marked it in three different colors. Green for commands, red for promises, and blue for key verses. A couple of years later, becoming more grown up and sophisticated, I got another version, the New American Bible, a contemporary Catholic translation. And I read and marked it as well, this time with only one color. This Bible I used for a number of years. It was smaller, easier to read, with some explanatory notes. And in the midst of all my Protestant friends, it was somewhat subversive. <laughs> During our understanding, I also had another Bible, a hardcover revised standard version of the study Bible that I used for all of my Bible classes in college, in seminary, and in some of my earliest classes at Duke in my graduate work. Clearly, I love having Bibles, a whole and one. Then, when I was in my second semester at Duke, I remember walking into the graduate lounge and talking to Byron, a New Testament grad student and an American Baptist preacher. I told him that in, the, in one of the courses I was taking, we were reading the book of 1 Peter in Greek. Byron smiled and said, good, people really ought to read the New Testament. I puzzled over that for a long time. For one thing, I didn't know him very well at the time, only well enough to know that he did have a good sense of humor. So, 
Did he merely mean what he said? That people ought to read the New Testament? Was he making some sort of Baptist statement? We Baptists read the Bible all the time, so what's with you Episcopalians? <laughs> Or was he just expressing dissatisfaction with the academic study of the New Testament? Or the students who only studied the Bible academically? I still don't know the answer to those questions. But that conversation stuck with him, especially his exhortation to read the New Testament. So why this trip down memory lane? Well, if you're anything like me, you two are fascinated with the Bible, or at least intrigued by others who are fascinated <laughs> with the Bible. <laughs> this book is a treasure. Most of us recognize that. But for some reason, we all have a difficult time admitting it. You know the reasons. I don't have enough time. My spouse will think I'm not religious. <laughs> as soon as I find a Bible I can understand, then I'll start reading it. I always get bogged down in the thou shalt's and the thou shalt nots and the big acts. The Old Testament is too vital for me. I don't like Paul's letters, they're anti women. Anybody have that one? Another reason why we might not read, mark, learn, and inwardly digest the Bible could be that some of us are afraid of what we might find there. We may be asked to do something we are willing to do. Some cherished and comfortable, but incomplete or faulty belief may be challenged. And then what do we do? In short, we may have to change. With those threats hanging over us, it's no wonder we find so many reasons for not engaging God's word to us. We may make frequent recourse to prayer, to telling God our problems and our needs, but we make less frequent recourse to the Bible, to hearing God's response. But what I really want to focus this morning is yet another possible reason that regular Bible study for many of us is difficult. To put it briefly, it just doesn't always make sense. I get it. We're reading a text that is at least 2,000 years old, maybe in some cases 3,000 years old. It speaks of cultures and societies with which we cannot identify. Laws in the Torah make little sense to us. I, I, I mean, why shouldn't I eat lobster or bacon? <laughs> bacon! <laughs> the New Testament may not be much better. All this concern, for example, in 2 Thessalonians about the second coming not happening, and all those people who seem to be idle. And in Luke, matters of wars, and rumors of wars, and earthquakes, what is going on? After many years, many degrees, and many Bibles, there are still times when I feel exactly that way. And then I recall a prayer one of my seminary professors wrote. O God, in ages past, you inspired holy men and women to set forth your truth in song and story, in prophecy and precept. Illumine my mind and attune my heart to hear and to understand what you have revealed through them in your holy word, that I may apply their lessons in my life and to my lives. This prayer, to me, is one that promises freedom to those who read the Bible. It recognizes that there are different ways that God's truth is revealed, as I pointed out a couple of weeks ago, a poem is different than a command. But the prayer also challenges me to apply their lessons from ages past in my life and to my times. There's no suggestion of slavish adherence to words or ideas, but an encouragement 
to seek the underlying lessons, the truth that was set forth in its original setting, and then to apply that underlying truth to my context. In other words, to make the biblical truth my own. Or put another way, to recognize that the biblical writers sought to understand God's presence in their world, we seek to understand that same presence in ours. This, I think, is what is at the root of what the, the Bukhalic is asking of us. The reading, marking, learning, and inwardly digesting is all about making the Bible our own. Your own. Not my own. This is one place in the prayer book where our Protestant Reformation heritage is made so clear. We have the privilege of reading the Bible for ourselves in a language we can understand. This is a challenge to avoid accepting someone else's interpretation of the scriptures blindly, whether it be that of a popular televangelist, that of the teaching office or the magisterium of the Roman Catholic Church, or that of the priest in charge, the Good Shepherd Episcopal Church. It is a challenge to make that book your book. In this regard, I'd like to relay a slightly modified story or parable I heard the other day from Jonathan Sachs, the former chief rabbi of Great Britain. It goes something like this. Imagine going into a library. As you browse the shelves, you stumble across a book with your name on it. Curious. You take it off the shelves and open it, discovering that it's a Bible. But before you get to Genesis 1-1's end of the beginning, there's a prefatory comment. What you are about to read is the story of your family. It contains the truths which your family has struggled to discover and understand and then has held dear for thousands of years. It tells about your history, the good times and the bad. It tells about your customs and traditions. It is the story that produced you. The preface compels you to page through the book. And after the last verse of Revelation, the grace of the Lord Jesus be with you all, amen, there are a number of blank pages with the prompt. The last chapters are yours to write. We have an invitation all of us. It's a lot like pulling down the family scrapbooks, photo albums or genealogies, paging through and wondering about the people in those old black and white photos, the yellowing newspaper clippings, the pressed flowers, stories, important stories are to be found when we discover it. We might need commentary, often called grammar or local Zeke. Sometimes a bit of historical background is helpful. Oh, religious persecution in Germany is what brought my ancestors here. Most of us, I think, are fascinated by our family's histories. The easy to hear bits, as well as the hidden, maybe embarrassing parts. We want to find our place in that larger story. Rabbi Sachs's parable really resonated with me. It provided an answer as to why I've collected so many Bibles. I do want to know where my story fits within the greater sweep of God's story. Perhaps his story appeals to you as well. If so, and you're uncertain how to crack the cover of this great family history, 
Let me or one of the other clergy know. There are commentaries, atlases, and translations, resources of plenty that will take you beyond the surface reading, defined as radio personality or hard used to say the rest of the story. When I was ordained a priest, Bishop Estel gave me yet another Bible, this one with my name on it. Whether it has my name printed on it or not, is much less important 